The Biophilic Leadership Summit is the only multi-day conference entirely dedicated to biophilic projects, principles, and research, bringing together the top industry leaders in an intimate, natural setting to network, build partnerships, and learn from each other. This year's summit will explore biophilic placemaking and how we can use biophilic principles to promote health, happiness, and vitality in public spaces. In addition to fascinating presentations, delicious farm-to-table meals at Serenby, and cocktails, this year's summer will feature a selection of biophilic experiences like forest bathing, bird watching, and more. So join us in Serenby for the 6th Annual Biophilic Leadership Summit from March 24th to March 26, 2024. Learn more about the summit and register today at biophilicsummit.com. That's biophilicsummit.com. We hope to see you there. Hi, I'm Monica Olson. And I'm Jennifer Walsh. And you're listening to the Biophilic Solutions Podcast, where every other week we sit down with experts and thought leaders across industries in order to explore the innate connection between humans and nature and why we need nature to thrive. We truly believe that in order to tackle the global environmental problems we're facing, we as humans must reconnect to the natural world and come to a better understanding of how we fit in and how we are so interconnected. So in every episode, we'll interview new guests that help us uncover and highlight nature-based solutions to get us on a path to greater health, tackling climate change, and ultimately getting outside and connecting with nature. So let's get to today's episode. Hey, Jennifer. Hey, Monica. Jennifer, out of curiosity, what is your approach to food? Are you vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian? That's a good question. I like all food. So <laughs> it's all about <laughs> balance. You know, I, I try not to eat too much meat, to be honest. I really rarely go for meat options on the uh, menu. So I try and eat as much plant-based as possible. Yeah, I'm with you. So my approach is that nothing in particular is off limits. I obviously don't like certain things, but I do try and eat food that is organic, ethically sourced, and I really don't eat red meat. I mean, here and there, don't get me wrong, like I'll have a bite of somebody's burger, but I try to make sure that it's ethically sourced or grass fed, pasture raised, all that stuff. I always want to try and be as knowledgeable as I can without really limiting myself to one specific type of diet. Absolutely. And I think that's a really great tie in to our episode today, which is mainly about shifting to a plant based diet. I think we both agree that the term plant based is really helpful because it's not restrictive. You don't have to be vegan or even vegetarian to eat a food that is largely dependent on healthy plant products. Yeah. And in previous episodes, we've talked a lot about the environmental and health benefits of eating organic food. And we've also tackled many of the issues around soil health. However, I'm not sure if we've ever really dived into the issues around maybe this industrial meat industry and how damaging it is to the environment and why we really do need to shift to a plant-based model. So our guest today is Seth Goldman, who is a co-founder and chief change agent at Eat the Change, a new line of plant-based snack foods. Alongside co-founder and chef Spike Mendelson, Seth's mission is to combine marketplace solutions with education and activism to empower consumers to make dietary choices that align with their concerns around climate and health. And if you don't know Seth by name, then you're more than likely aware of some of his products that he's created in the past years, including Honest Tea. And the restaurant Plant Burger, that's P-L-N-T Burger. He's also the chair of the board at Beyond Meat. So let's get to our conversation with Seth Goldman. Seth, thank you so much for being with us today. We want to dive right in. Your company is Eat the Change. Tell us what that is and why you named it that. Eat the Change is really a call to action. It's really an effort to awaken in consumers a recognition that the choices we make about what we eat are our single biggest daily impact on the planet. And then we have created a line of products that reflect our concerns. So it's about moving people towards more plant-based diets, towards more organic sourcing, and then even looking at the ingredients, finding crops that are water efficient, energy efficient, and of course, nutrient dense as well. The end result, leading to healthier diets and a more environmentally lighter footprint for our food system. I know you're a, basically like a serial entrepreneur. How long did it take you to create this new business of yours? I had finished up with Honest Tea at the end of 2019, and I'm still involved with Beyond Meat. I transitioned to be from executive chairman to chair of the board, and that gave me a little more time to just think about our food system. And of course, this was right at the beginning of the pandemic. So mm. I got a lot of time. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and it also really helped me think about just how we interact with 
the, our planet and with each other and even with other living beings. And I'm involved as a co-founder in a restaurant chain called Plant Burger, which not surprisingly sells all plant-based foods. And the head of marketing at Plant Burger created this slogan, eat the change you wish to see in the world. Mm. And for me, that, that really resonated with me. It's like, yes, that's what we want people to do. And as I was looking, I hosted a, a visit to a mushroom farm for the Eat the Change culinary team because they were serving a mushroom bacon barbecue burger. And we went to visit this mushroom farm and I realized oh. what incredible ingredients mushrooms are. They're super energy efficient, water efficient. They can grow in any climate condition because they grow indoors. And they're also incredibly versatile as an ingredient. And with the chef who's head of plant burger, Spike Mendelson, in his hands, a mushroom can become anything. And then I realized he would be a perfect partner to create a food brace, a snack brand called Eat the Change. And then we started yeah. playing around with mushroom ingredients. And then we got to dive deeper and really kind of envision if you were creating a new brand from scratch, what would be the right kind of guardrails, the right kind of guidance to give the brand. And, and so we just kept going and innovating and finding other commitments we can make around biodiversity and ingredients to really help create something that we hope will be really powerful and a platform for a whole food transition. I absolutely love that. And so for the listeners, it's mostly snacks right now. Is that correct? All of the yes. the chain So we brand. started with mushroom jerky. And then I was talking to Spike about how when I was at Honest Tea, our most successful innovation there was a line called Honest Kids, which was a, mm, yeah. a less sweet yep. organic juice drink. And I thought, how can we make a snack that plays that same role in a lunchbox? But obviously, for a lot of reasons, didn't think mushrooms was the right idea to sell to kids. <laughs> that makes sense. That's, 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 a lot that's, of sense. Well, I'm, a pretty, of uh, <laughs> I'm a creative marketer, but not that creative. So we looked in other directions and our thought was to say, could we make a carrot chip? And we got hmm. some interesting prototypes, but we just couldn't scale that idea. We were losing a lot of the carrot because you can only use sort of the top third. And we couldn't get the right crispness. And so... Spike had some carrots in the kitchen. They actually sent the wrong cut. They sent little um, sort of dime-sized carrots that we couldn't make a chip out of, but he tried something different. He soaked them in a marinade and then dried them out, and then they took on this chewy flavor, and we realized that could be a really creative approach to a snack for kids. And so it, it actually became what we call Cosmic Carrot Chews, which is a line oh, of uh, I love it. chewy carrot snacks for kids, and they're great, they're delicious, and they are servings of carrots in a pouch. So that became our next product line. And then we were busy <laughs> selling those snacks when in May of this year, Coca-Cola announced they were discontinuing Honest Tea. Uh, I was so sad to yeah. see that. Oh, uh, yeah, you me were. Too. <laughs> so were. I know. I mean, you, I mean, you must have been horrified. But, but we, I was horrified. Baby to Coca-Cola and then yeah. they, quote, sunsetted it, which yeah. Yeah, for whatever reason, it made me so sad. I was really sad. And so after about two weeks of mourning, my team mm -hmm. and I got together and we said, wait a minute, because we were getting approached by other folks. Hey, could we go launch another tea brand and you guys could help us out? And I'm like, well, well if anybody's going to launch this, it should be our team. We So we have yeah. now we yeah. have 16 people on staff. Nine of them worked at Honest Tea. So we have over 100 wow. years of selling organic bottled tea. Oh like, if anyone's going to launch this, it should be us. And so like, let's we, we'll do it ourselves. Yeah, exactly. So we just literally yesterday was the first sighting of a bottle of just iced tea in a store. So oh, it's wow. just about to happen. Yeah. And we, so we've <laughs> launched it. it. We've launched it nationally. And people can now go find Just Ice Tea to quench uh, their thirst. And I love that, that the honest tea, right, is a honest tea or the word. And then this is the same thing, justice. <laughs> so cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it is. I mean, I love the well, sort of play. And it really resonated because all of the sourcing is fair trade certified, which means we're helping to invest in these communities, which really plays a transformational role. It takes them from subsistence farming to a model where they can invest back into the community, into schools, healthcare, and really mm -hmm. transform the role that their farming plays in their lives. And it's the way to really lift whole communities beyond subsistence into economic opportunity and and of course, it also describes the taste of the tea because it is tea leaves. And then what we say is just sweet enough. So it's got some sweetness for some of them. Some of them are unsweetened, but what we say just okay. sweet enough. So not drowning in calories. Sugars. Well, yeah. Cause yeah. That's the trend is moving away, from, or at least I think at our yeah. age, moving away from that 
and yeah. thinking about more whole, less processed, what can we do? And I remember, right, I think you guys had, was it a white peach? Or there was something that you guys had that also got discontinued that was like my favorite flavor of Honest. <laughs> so it was like yes. a subtle peach. Peach right? white tea. Yeah, it was delicious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <gasps> yeah. But I love the back. Are you going to do, do a version? We're working on it. We're working. Oh, good. Good. I'm glad. Okay. I love that one too, Monica. Well, I love the sense of discovery for you, Seth. And that, that's the sheer sign of an entrepreneur that's always discovering and realizing. Because I think, aren't you a marathon runner? Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I too am a marathon. Well, I've been a marathon runner most of my life. I used to drink all the sugary, terrible things that were available in the market like 20 yeah. plus years ago that were so like, here I was, you know, training for, for races. And here I was downing this awful, I'm not going to say the name of the brands. And that was the only thing that was available in the market. And then, you know, you get to create this because again, you find it's a need for something that's so much better for us and healthier. And I love the sense of the entrepreneur because I'm a fellow entrepreneur of 25 years. So I get <laughs> that path of discovery, but also having to continue to create. So when Honest Tea is done, you have to keep going and create something in multiple ways. So I so appreciate that. Yeah. It always helps when you are the first consumer <laughs> of a product, yeah, right? Yes. And, and it's well, something that plays a role be, in right? your life. Yeah, it certainly helps. But the only danger there is if you get too wrapped up with what you want and not what mm. other consumers want. And the good news is, just as you noted, there were a lot of people who, I mean, you go back to where we launched Honest Tea 24 years ago, there were only sweet drinks in the market. And obviously there was a demand for more. And what's interesting now is it has shifted. There's lots more variety. And I think Honest Tea mm. played a role in helping to kind of you know, break oh, up that definitely. concentration of sweet drinks. Now it'll be interesting to see because now we aren't, we certainly not the least sweet drink in the market, but we'll have the chance to see how much of an appetite there is for what we call just sweet enough drinks. And we'll obviously bring out some more zero calorie drinks as well. Well, and I think everybody's looking for a healthier alternative, whatever that might be, whether that's like low or no alcohol mm -hmm. or these seltzers or kind of, you know, everybody's in really into bubble water, right? And so that's yeah. these flavored waters that ideally don't have bad stuff in them or we, we don't know what's in them. But no, I love that. And I'm excited about the carrots. And did I see that some of the carrots had sort of a sweet flavor to them, like cherry? Well, they all, yeah. So there's a cherry, a sour cherry berry. And then the other thing we've done is also launched an adult version of the carrot juice because okay. we're eating uh -huh. them. The kids packaging definitely has a kid friendly look to it. You can sort of mm -hmm. see rocket uh -huh. chips and this kind of thing. Yes. The adult yeah. package, but we realized like, well, it's great for kids, but adults, what happened was I was taking them on hikes with me and they're so good. And we're like, wait a minute, adults should be able to enjoy these too. Because yeah, right. here's the interesting statistic. While it only 7% of American children are getting their recommended daily allowance of vegetables, only 10% of American adults are. So we've got to find ways wow. to make adults be able to access vegetables in a more convenient, more mm -hmm. accessible way. And, and we think this is one of the ways to do that. And so it just, wow. and, they and they taste so good. So then Spike got in the kitchen and came up with more adult formulations of the carrot juice, like a maple cardamom and a ginger turmeric. Mm, wow. Um, a Meyer lemon. So those are really fun too. Okay. okay. Well, we're going to get all this. Because I think you're <laughs> like you're in Whole Foods and Sprouts and Fresh Market. And yeah. The carrot chews the, for kids are on all those chains. The Well, and the mushroom jerkies in Fresh Market, we're just, you know, some of these products are brand new. So they're just starting to roll okay. out. And can you buy them online too? Or are yeah, they yeah, only we have that all at okay. eatthechange.com. Yeah. Okay, perfect, perfect, perfect. Yeah. Um, well, one well, thing that we're doing that you might find interesting, we are not going to yeah. be selling our bottled tea online. From our point of view, if we're serious about having a light environmental it, footprint, we should not be shipping say, glass bottles of glass liquid heavy. through the mail. Mm -hmm. So we're just not going to do it. But of course, the stores, that's a case where the stores play a really important role and they are a more environmentally efficient, concentrated model. So obviously we'll sell it that way. Yeah. And glass is great. I like that you guys have it in glass. I know it's heavier, but we really, that's a whole nother conversation, you know, with the plastic mm -hmm. issue, which is, mm -hmm. it's a toughie. Because yeah. plastic yeah. does a lot of great things, but plastic does a lot of bad things. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think we're never going to get to a place that's perfect. We are just trying mm -hmm. to do our best. And anytime you sell a single serve package, obviously you have a footprint. And mm -hmm. we made the decision that, We'd rather not be part of a plastic beverage <laughs> movement. Let's try to step away from that. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. One of the things that I find fascinating is you guys also have an impact fund. Yes. And so I was reading that you guys have given away over a million dollars, like yeah. 1.2, 1.3 million dollars. 
Can you talk a little bit about that? Is sure. that an annual giving program, like kind of yeah. a grant program? Yeah. How, so, how did that it, come about? Just before we launched the business, and this was once again, right at the start of the pandemic, we're like, well, wait a minute, how do we create a food system that is more focused on planet friendly diets? And so before we even launched the brand, we just started to explore, and this is my wife and I wanted to explore what kind of nonprofits are out there helping to democratize planet friendly diets. And what we learned mm-hmm. is there's obviously a lot of education needed, a lot of expanding mm-hmm. access to distribution needed, especially in communities where there isn't as much economic opportunity. And so what we did is we took money from our own assets, not from Eat the Change as a company, but we put it under the Eat the Change umbrella because we wanted to talk. And it is about helping democratize that idea. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so we do it out of this office and we found some amazing and really inspiring organizations, everything from setting up community gardens in neighborhoods, Mm -hmm. actually where you used to have blight and putting a garden in there to Mm -hmm. improving awareness in the classroom, to Mm -hmm. helping to fund an effort to educate doctors about planet, the advantages of plant-based diets, to helping organizations when they hold an event think about making a default option as plant-based as opposed to sort of uh, letting everyone. Fantastic. So all these different approaches yep. that help widen the, the access to these kind of diets and help people discover them. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. that's so key, right? Is the, I think what you're doing is it's all about education. So if we don't know why we need it, right. but you're right. going into the schools and talking to the doctors, that's like the front line of how do we teach people about why we need it and how important it is just not for ourselves, but of course, for planetary health. That's right. It's a double bonus, right? Because it is better for the people eating it. We know that. Mm -hmm. And if we can help the planet at the same time, we've also found that can really be about empowerment in a lot of communities where Mm -hmm. people feel like you've heard sort of even conspiracy theories about what big food is trying to do to people. It's like, well, I can take it in my own hands. And so having the education about healthier options and sometimes economically less expensive options that are planet-based our plant based is, mm-hmm. is also empowering too. Well, I think the whole thinking about the food system as a system, we work with a lot of farmers. The neighborhood that I live in is in the city called Chattahoochee Hills, and it's like legacy farmland that a lot of families have left over the years because of that age old story like there was nothing there. So the kids left, they were selling off the land to get developed. And so the city created like an overlay of 70% of the land will be preserved and will only build on the remaining 30%. So that 70% could go into farming. And so the Rodale Institute, which I'm sure you're familiar with, sure. has opened a Southeastern Education Center in the city to think about, it's not just saying, oh, we need more farmers, which we do, but what's that whole ecosystem yeah. around them? Like mm-hmm. to your point, like there has to be an end consumer. So where do they get the food? Is there a farmer's market? Is there a CSA? Is there packaged goods Mm -hmm. that can be sold with jams, jellies, drinks? So I love that, thinking of the whole system and getting people to think about it because we don't realize, people don't even know where the food comes from. So Yeah, yeah. yeah, for sure. It's really exciting. I was in the sort of like our research, you wrote an amazing kind of like talking about the approach of the food innovation and like Mm -hmm. why. And obviously plant-based is still, I love, I think plant-based is where we have all landed. The vegan, vegetarian, all these words that kind of scare people, but Mm plant-based doesn't feel so restrictive, right? (laughs) So, yeah, right. I mean, and so tell me a little bit about that and why plant-based, how the burger company, you know, obviously you're a partner or you're involved with Beyond Meat, but just the plant P-L-N-T restaurant (laughs) business. Talk a little bit about that because- I think we all need to think about eating less meat. Well, the nice thing about the term plant-based is that basically everything is plant-based, right? I mean, even animals, <laughs> animals are plant-based, True. right? So when yeah. we talk True. about eating cows, like cows fuel their bodies through plants. Eat cows that ate plants. That yeah, exactly. Cows yeah. That yeah. ate corn. Yeah, yeah exactly. So <laughs> plants are nutrify everything. And I think for that reason, the term doesn't mean exclusively plant-based, though, you know, I myself am vegan. Mm-hmm. We don't want people to feel like the only way to eat and live is to be plant vegan or plant based because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. then you yeah, you, yeah. you dramatically limit the audience. And so sure. plant based yeah. comes across as much less judgmental, much mm. more inclusive, yeah. much more inviting. Yep. So for us, that term has appeal. 
And so then yeah. we think about when we created Plant Burger, you could all, I mean, we call, as you know, PLNT Burger, you could also just read that as Planet Burger or mm. Plenty, mm. Plenty okay. Burger. I so, like that. You know, nice. We wanted to make it nebulous enough that somebody could sort of, didn't have to feel like, oh, I'm not vegan, so I don't want to go there. Yeah. And, and what we've done is if you look at the website at plantburger.com, or any of our Instagram, it's all showing just delicious, not all, but most of the content is around delicious looking burgers and shakes and Mm. fries. And it doesn't, I mean, yes, it is all plant-based, but those products look delicious to anybody, not just to Mm -hmm. a vegan. Once again, Mm -hmm. trying to be inclusive, I think is really important in this whole movement. And it would be nice if (laughs) there were more vegans out there. If we rely on them for curing our food system, which is never going to happen, it's too small an audience. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons why at Beyond Meat, when we were launching the Beyond Burger, we knew we didn't want that burger merchandise in the freezer section of the store because the freezer section is where all the vegans used to shop. We wanted it to be uh, carried in the meat section of the grocery store. Uh, oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, so okay, much wider audience than you're reaching over 95% of the people who buy burgers. Oh, that's brilliant. Uh, Yeah, because I was like, these are not, because we're, my husband was vegan for a bit, but he's really, he is a bit, he'll eat a little bit of fish, but super vegetarian. Yeah. And I'm a little bit here and there, but try to be really thoughtful about where the Flexitarian, that's right. (laughs) But I try to be very thoughtful of where that meat comes from, mostly. But we would do a lot of veggie burgers. You're right, though. They were all in the boxes Mm -hmm. in the freezer section. And so when we started trying the Impossibles and the Beyond and all the other stuff, like corn was an interesting brand. I mean, still around because that was like actually a decent replacement for chicken at the time mm-hmm. i was like oh this is brilliant that this is in the meat section mm-hmm. like it made no. it was so smart i thought from a marketing standpoint but i love that that was a very intentional yeah for sure and what was neat was that the meat buyers were willing to give it a try right it, just because yeah. we wanted it to be carried there didn't mean that yeah <laughs> it was guaranteed right, that, they, so, that we're gonna let you in yeah yeah so we, you know our first partner to do that was whole foods and then we got huh. safeway in Northern California. And then when Safeway yeah. did it, Kroger followed. And then it really became the place where these products get carried. And it, it really did make a difference in expanding access to it. Was that a big push for yeah. you? I mean, did you have to go above and beyond to say, listen, we want to be in this section versus yeah, somewhere else? Sure. Well, yeah. and then what helped is that the numbers, the product sold. So just because we say we want it there, if it yeah, doesn't yeah, sell, then it's a problem. But fortunately it did. And, and yeah, and that's been a transformation it's easy sometimes to look at it, things and sort of get frustrated and no change is happening. But the fact is, in just the past five years, mm-hmm. think of all the changes that have happened like that. Absolutely. This category didn't exist oh. five years ago. So, yeah. No. And I mean, I can't remember. Maybe is it impossible that's the Whopper? Like, I can't yeah. remember. But like, yeah. you know, when you have huge chains taking on yeah. a plant-based mm-hmm. burger... Yeah, that's game changing. You know, like not only for my husband and you that we're on the road and can get something to eat that isn't just French fries, but that it's just showing the masses. It feels very accessible to your point. But I think that's the big thing is that we're trying to educate people that if we limit our over-reliance on animal based Mm -hmm. agriculture, because so much of it is very detrimental to the planet, the way the industrial animal agriculture is done Mm-hmm. not friendly and so has beyond quantified any of that like for every x beyond burgers you're saving x oh yeah something. you must yeah. have done some sort of like analysis yeah. we worked with the university of michigan a few years ago on a life cycle analysis yeah. again compared to a beef burger oh, it found that a beyond burger uses 99 wow. percent less water 93 percent less land and creates 90 percent yeah. fewer greenhouse gases. So it's significant. It's not just like, oh, this is 10% better. It's a dramatic difference. And when you see it like that, and then you realize you're getting the same nutritional profile without, of course, cholesterol and much less saturated fat, then you're really in a place like, wow, okay, we have to make this more accessible and expand it. Is there a future for like, I mean, I know that there's all sorts of plant stuff in it. Like I'm not even sure what it is in and beyond, but like more of a mushroom-based burger. Like people doing that too. in that same... Okay. Yeah, the, but people exploring all types of options. Yeah, I mean, I think I just what didn't you're know with s- all of your mushroom work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, well, we're not doing it to eat the change. We got our hands full with our okay. uh, product, but there are <laughs> there are companies looking at that as well. And so there's a lot of innovation happening. This is a it's an exciting moment for our food system where there's more recognition. I don't want to say universal, but there's certainly more recognition that we have to change the way our food mm-hmm. system is heading. And so there's a lot of innovation. 
sometimes, I don't want to say too much, but sometimes there's just a proliferation of a lot of me too's. Mm -hmm. So that's happening as well. But that's anytime the innovation, you get that. But there's also some new directions being explored. I think that's our biggest conversation with Monica and I try and have with our guests is just having the conversations to educate the changes that are happening that need to happen for wider acceptance and understanding. And it's just these like almost like micro dose moments of like, how do we then have the conversations (laughs) bigger to make the change that we need to, like what you said, eat the change and be that change. Because what you're talking about also is like making these small changes in like even terms of like packaging and shipping. So the products you do have, how are those being implemented to make them, I don't want to say sustainable or just different than maybe you thought about before? It's still hard. I don't want to suggest we've got perfect solutions. We continue to look at ways to lightweight packaging. When we initially launched our mushroom jerky, we did use a recyclable bag. It was a bag that could be recycled along with grocery bags. But what we found is that they weren't being recycled. You just can't do everything. We're certainly eager to to find a compostable or biodegradable bag that can still be food safe. We haven't found that yet. And I think the challenge is a small company like ours just isn't going to have the resources to develop these products and develop the packaging. So we do rely on bigger companies to do that. And we're certainly receptive and happy to be a experimenter, but it's hard to do all of those things. What we did with the bottle tea, of course, is we knew glass was going to be the right package. And so we did that, but we're also looking at, could we explore other sustainable packaging options, not plastic, but other options that might be effective mm-hmm. ways to ship liquids. So we're still looking. Anybody that you're looking at that is larger that's doing innovation? Well, uh, one of the really neat things we did when I was launching Honest Tea with Coca-Cola in Germany is we had a bottle, a glass bottle that was refillable and reusable. And so what they would do is sell the glass bottle. And Mm -hmm. then in a way, this was an old fashioned solution. Then consumers would return those bottles. The bottles would get returned to the bottling plant, rinsed and refilled. There wasn't infinite uses, but at least 10 or 12 reuses per bottle. Yeah. So that's a great example of closed loop. And the recapture rate in Germany was over 90%. So, you know, here in the U.S., wow. we, talk about, we talk about recycling rates under 30% in the U.S. What? And to get refillable Ugh. bottles at 90% is really, Incredible. that's exciting and transformational. But that, there's so many differences, right? It's a federal system versus what we have. We don't uh, have state recycling standards. We have different, every municipality has a different recyclable mm-hmm. thing. And then you've got yeah. certain states that don't recycle glass. So the U.S. has a long way to go to get to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. yeah you, you do sort of wish there would be the heavy hand in that case of yeah. the federal government coming down and saying, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. But I know, you know, everybody hold your breath. these states, right? <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. I, know. I know. I mean, I'm in Georgia, so I understand. <laughs> and I'm right New York City, that, so yeah, totally. <laughs> And on a side note, New York City, I get to go ahead and eat at your restaurant. So oh, yeah. check it out. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah definitely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, you are. You got to come, come up and see. We have a juice company that's cold pressed juice and it's in glass bottles and they have a huge risk. I don't know what their number is, but it's a home delivered product because oh, you can't great. sell. Yeah. Everything has to be heat pressurized or heat H. PP, whatever it is. Yeah. And so they sell it either out of there or they're juicing it in, in the neighborhood that I'm in, Serenby, or mm-hmm. it's home delivery, which is super mm-hmm. cool. But they do a huge pick back up. You know, yeah. they say not only what we've delivered, the ice thing, everything. And so That's I great. wish we could do more of that, but it is a very municipality or neighborhood by neighborhood situation. Yeah. And you get into these situations where it's, it's just not scalable. Which you start to say, like, do we have to scale? Do we always have to grow? Do we have, you know, there's a little bit of that that I start to question, but I do wish the bigger companies would take a stand. Mm -hmm. There's just not the little guys. One of the other things I think is really interesting is Jen and I talk about it as well. And I kind of want to go back to that 7% and 10%. That is wild to me, the daily value of vitamins. Has that been something? Vegetables. Vegetables. Yeah. Vegetables. Is that been something that's, a recent phenomenon over the past 50 years? I don't what know. What happened? <laughs> I don't know, but I think as people get further You away, have to have the answer, Seth. I, want the- <laughs> I, I, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if it's certainly continuing to get worse, but people are mm-hmm. moving away from Whole Foods. They're moving away from the farmland. As you mentioned, they don't know where food comes from. As we've put an emphasis on convenience and on-go yep. foods, there's just less 
And part of it is that the big food companies went to sort of, I'm going to say the lowest common denominator, but the cheapest, easiest solution. And so sure. part of what we think our role is as entrepreneurs is to help find ways to get people to upgrade their diets, find different ways and food different ways. What's so neat about the carrots, as an example, is yeah. there's not, it is a new product for sure. There's nothing else like it, but it's not some fancy newfangled technology. This is right. uh, organic apple juice and carrots. Wow. Those are the main ingredients. So Sounds it's great. just finding a novel way to combine them mm -hmm. that we've done. And so that's part of what makes this whole venture so fun. We can still catalyze change in people's diets. It takes obviously good marketing and good innovation yeah. and good packaging, all those things. But it's not like we have to go create a space food or something like that. Sure. <laughs> no. Absolutely. Absolutely. No. So are you just yeah. able then to go in the kitchen or whatever with the spike you're saying and just kind of create these new vegetable ideas? And I think that'd well, be so much is, fun. Yeah, no, it's great because I'll give him the broad guidelines of what we're trying to do. And then yeah. he'll just work in the kitchen. And in a way, this one was almost an accident because, as I said, we were trying to go after a, a carrot chip. And then when he mm -hmm. kind of came across this, he's like, it was like, oh, well, that's interesting. You know, we didn't expect it, but we realized. Yeah. And then here's another little really interesting insight we learned is that slightly cooked carrots are actually more uh -huh. nutritious than raw carrots. Because what oh, happens is, uh, especially for children, raw carrots, the cell walls are so tough, you can't break down the walls and absorb all the nutrients. But when carrots oh. are slightly cooked, as our carrots are, then your body does a better job. They're called more bioavailable. And so oh, yeah. that was like another really neat thing to learn in the process here. And of course, carrots, I think everyone can recognize the benefits of carrots and vitamin A in particular, uh, which is an excellent source of. And then as we see all these kids spending more time in front of screens, you mm -hmm. know, the benefits of having more vitamin A are really obvious. And so there's just a lot of neat things that come from this. I love that. You also talk about part of it in a way, maybe that's part of it. The innovation is the undoing of food. That's so right. like undoing food. So talk about that a little bit. That yeah, approach. what that is, is a really simple way to break down. As I mentioned, a lot of um, when you get emphasis on convenience, you're kind of combining lots of ingredients and often stripping out the nutrients related to those ingredients. Mm -hmm. When you undo food, you're using whole foods and using organic ingredients and transparent supply chains. And so that's our whole approach at Eat the Change. Any of our ingredients whether it's the mushroom jerky or the carrot juice, you can look at it and say, I recognize that as a mushroom or as a carrot. And even with the tea, obviously it's tea, but what we're, our main ingredient is tea leaves. There's no, a lot of times when bottled tea companies make tea, like the, some of the brands you mentioned earlier, the ingredient that comes into the bottling plant is not tea. It's either a powder or a syrup or some yeah. concentrate that's been derived. Yeah. You've lost a lot of the essential nutrients. What's neat about our tea, when you brew it, you're getting exactly the same health benefits, the same antioxidants you'd get mm -hmm. if you were brewing hot tea at home. And so okay. that undoing of food really preserves those nutrients. And that's in contrast, there's another thing called redoing of food. And that's where right. an example is that what you'll see at a Beyond Meat, where they are trying to recreate a category and with the same nutrients, the same benefits, even the same taste profile but used without some of the externalities. And that's what a Beyond Meat will do, or like a plant-based dairy, like an Oatly or a Ripple will do. Yep. And these are ways to still provide the same use occasion. So if you need a burger yep. in a bun, that's a burger in a bun, mm -hmm. or milk on a, yep. in, co in coffee or in cereal, but where you've left out some of the externalities, whether they're environmental or health shortcomings of the animal incumbent product. Yeah, my husband wow. does a egg product. It's yeah. in a yellow, what, I don't even know what it's called. Just egg, yeah. But it's an, just yes, egg, just okay. Egg. Yeah. Sorry, of course, just tea, just. But yeah, and he loves that. And my kids have started doing it. I don't do a ton of eggs, but it's great. You can put it in, you can do anything with it. And that's you can, incredible. We, my wife um, makes a quiche with it. You can do that too. So, you know, there's, oh. you can recreate a lot of these foods just with plant-based substitutes. Hmm. Which is so great. Yeah. And then the other, what's the mayo? Is it just mayo? Maybe. maybe I'm just there's all kinds. There's <laughs> all your heart mayo. But, there yeah. You know. There's like the avocado mayo, which yep, is super yep. cool. Um, yeah. 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 So, so much of it is starting to just weave into people's lives without it being, again, back to the whole vegan thing. It's just like, oh, this is just a smarter way to eat. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yep. 
So if we sort of position it that way, I think that's interesting. The undoing and the redoing, I think, is super cool from an idea. And then what's important standpoint. is to keep in mind taste. You've still got to deliver on taste. You can do of all course. these creative approaches, but if it doesn't replicate the taste expectations, and for that matter, even when you're cooking a burger, it has to sizzle on the grill. Tech- um, it sure. has to yeah. transform. The color has to change from pinkish to brownish as it cooks. Um, so mm-hmm. there's a lot involved. It's these things are all in continuing to improve. And that's like a really exciting area for you to be in. Obviously, you sound really passionate about it. And I think, again, as we tend to sort of demonize the large companies, which sometimes it's worth it, but sometimes they can be the catalyst, right? The Walmart says we're doing all LED or we're bringing all organic food. in. some of these huge companies can really make a huge difference. But a lot of it starts with the entrepreneurs like yourself where you guys kind of had the kernel of an idea, but maybe didn't have the scale. But, I think but we all really rely gratifying. on the consumer. So we can come up with great ideas, but if we can't win the consumer over, then mm-hmm. it doesn't happen. And the big chains don't get excited if the consumer's not there too. So we really sure. need to rely on consumers to take an interest, to, to give a try and to be loyal and continue to spread the word. And that's where our, mm-hmm. the power happens. Well, I also you like your title, do- by the way, Seth. Your chief change agent. I kind of, I like the title. Yes. (laughs) Thank you. That is really good. Sorry, Monica. I know you're saying something. Go ahead. (laughs) Oh, no, no, no. no. I was just wondering, like, so you've got your impact fund, but it sounds like that's a little bit more of a private, you know, it's a personal impact fund that is branded. Same mission and and Um, cause as Eat the Change. Which is beautiful. And I think that's a great way to sort of package it up. But are you guys doing any advocacy on the federal level? Like, are you working with anybody on the farm bill or no you know, we're so we're so okay. early we're just trying to get the business uh, yeah it's a lot we, we're yeah. part of the organic trade association we support that we're okay. doing our work with fair yep. trade usa so we support that but we're too small and so we saw you know we'll sign on when someone says they want to do something to promote awareness around climate, but we're just trying to survive as a business. <laughs> yeah, right. You can only do so much as a, I want to say startup, but yeah, when you're yeah. just, even though you've yeah. been doing this for most of your life, yeah. starting new things, yeah. it's still that process of creating something new and putting it out in the world and hoping yeah. that people will say, oh, I want to be a part of this journey with this brand. And I Absolutely. fully understand that 100%. So, yeah, and that's what's energizing, well, building something new, creating a new mm-hmm. community of followers and supporters, yeah. a new group of retailers. And so that's part of the challenge. Yeah. Well, and I think your advocacy is with the consumer, right? Because oh, yeah. if you can it's get broad-based itself. buy-in, they are the advocates. And I almost feel like it's sort of a cliche at this point, but you vote three times a day when you eat mm-hmm. or maybe more. Mm-hmm. And we should be doing that in a really thoughtful way. And so we always, that's again, Jen and I are always like, if anything else, people can walk away and make small changes that can become big changes as we influence others and educate them on, well, why would I try that? Yep. So yep. I think that's really exciting. One of the other things I wanted to know was, are there anything like just to sort of more like things that didn't work out or you really were like, <laughs> oh, okay, we, we've been trying the mushrooms and try the carrots. Like what if we did beets or are there other oh, yeah. products that you're trying to play around with? Or? We're exploring with all types of things. I mean, for us, it's always that option. How do we go further? We've got a really neat prototype with Brussels sprouts as an example. Ooh. Oh, uh, you know, what is that? Yeah. yeah so what do that? we do with that? And how do we make that delicious yeah. and fun? Yeah. And is there enough of an audience for that? We did another one. This was so fun. Spike made a watermelon prosciutto. So think about like those thin, what? thinly sliced Ooh, ham. Yeah. Would, uh, and he would brine the watermelon and then smoke it. It was so cool. Ah, I'm like, it's oh, amazing. Nice. I don't know how we scale that. So there's a lot of fun yeah. to explore. Can I just come to your kitchen, Seth? <laughs> Yeah. Do you use the plant restaurant as a little bit of a test? Oh, yeah. Or is it hard? Yeah. yeah. No, no. I mean, so a lot of the original recipes, so like a maple mustard that we use at the restaurant was a great way to develop a prototype for a mushroom jerky of that flavor. So a lot of the flavors, uh, the teriyaki ginger that we use for the mushroom jerky, yeah. once again, that sort of came from the chefs at Plant Burger. So, and then of course, Plant Burger was the first place to carry and sell a bottle of just iced tea in oh, New York City. Wonderful. So, yeah, so it's a great Perfect. interaction, great symbiosis between the two. 
Sure. Yeah. Are you planning to open more of those or? Yeah, we just opened our 13th up in Dedham, Massachusetts. Fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, more coming. Wonderful. Any coming to the Atlanta market? Not yet. We're sticking in the Northeast. (laughs) It's kind of frenetic pace. We're basically opening one every quarter. And so we got to make sure we can keep the team sort of of course, it, it, of course. coherent. Well, and are sense. you doing local sourcing too? Like, how is that? Because I know not you too know, much. That's yeah. Okay. Here's the interesting thing about local hard. sourcing. It is useful, but especially when you're talking about protein, for example, by the time you've chosen, whether it's plant-based or animal-based, whether it's locally sourced or not, that's a rounding error. So mm, even yeah. if you're getting locally sourced beef in Atlanta, that beef could come from New Zealand. It wouldn't that your, your impact is already so much worse sure. than a plant based mm-hmm. burger, whether it's local or not, is almost immaterial. And so mm-hmm. for us, well, it's really about can we just get and companies like Beyond Meat, they don't really have regional sources. Uh, no, no, I just didn't know. We have a challenge in Georgia of not the demand for organic is much greater yeah. than what we can supply in the market. Mm-hmm. And so like Emory Healthcare, for instance, has an initiative to source 100% local. I don't know what the radius is, um, yeah. but they haven't been able to fulfill it because we just don't have mm-hmm. enough farmers. Yeah. Well, well it's ironic. So, My son was at Emory and his senior thesis oh, was looking oh, at wow. the Emory food system because oh, the no university kidding. had Amazing. a commitment to move towards lightening its carbon footprint And then the dining services had a commitment to move towards local sourcing. And those two sound, they may sound like those align, but they're really not. Because if you're really about lowering your carbon footprint, the local pieces, as I said, is marginal compared to if you can move people towards more plant-based diets, that's a much bigger impact. So, Okay. That's incredible. That's interesting. Where is yeah. he now? What did, did he? Did so he now works for food? a, yeah, he's in the food business. He works for a plant-based dairy company out of California. They sell, it's called Eclipse Foods and they sell plant-based okay. ice cream. Oh, fantastic. Oh, yeah. Good for him. That's exciting. exciting. That's, yeah, yeah. Good for him. yeah, exactly. You can have your carrot chips and a little bit of plant-based ice cream <laughs> for <a> dessert. <laughs> exactly. What's next then? So, you know, you guys sounds like you're trying to out stuff, figuring out how to scale watermelon prosciutto, which I want. Um, what, <laughs> well, what, what's gotta, the next thing? I mean, it seems products. like you're very busy. We are busy. We've got to scale the products we have. I mean, we've got yeah. three major innovations, the mushrooms, the carrot juice, and the tea. They're all basically, they've all been on the market for less than a year. So as much as we get excited about the next innovation, we've got to make sure these product lines yep. get to market. Okay. Consumer awareness happens, and then we get to scale them. Well, we hope to help awesome. aid in their consumer awareness, by the way. And thank you for that. you and everything that you do. And how can we support you? Are you online? Are you on social? Yeah, like thank where, you. where can we follow yeah. you? So eatthechange.com is the place to find all the products and actually to do shopping if you want. And then you can follow us on Instagram. I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter myself. Twitter, it's Honest Seth, and LinkedIn is just Seth Goldman. And I've been sharing a lot of content as we prepare to launch the tea line and the kind of thoughts about Coca-Cola steps and how that mm. impacted our supplier chain and what we're doing there. So for us, it's all about transparency and authenticity. And so we try to have really honest conversations with a community interested in, in what we're doing. We're excited to support you and your growth and your next ventures. And we're really happy to know you now. So thanks for taking the time with us today. Great to be with you guys. Take care. So much. What a joy. So Jennifer, I really enjoyed this conversation with Seth and want to reiterate that we don't want to take away from this conversation to be that you need to overhaul your diet and go vegan. It's more about reframing food, thinking about where it comes from, making informed swaps for healthier and environmentally friendly foods. I love that you just said that. Reframing food. I mean, if every listener swapped just a couple of meals a week with something plant-based instead of meat, those changes that seem tiny on an individual level can really add up and make a huge impact. Absolutely. And that goes back to the point about larger corporations also taking on the challenge because when a large company like a Coke or Pepsi makes a big shift, the ripple effects can be huge. I also think Seth is such a smart entrepreneur in a couple of different ways. First, he's thinking about kids' snacks, while more and more parents are thinking about health and sugar intake. So if you can get a healthier snack that kids really like, and it's also better for the planet, that's a win-win all the way around. Second, he was very clear that you can't sacrifice taste. 
We can talk about plant-based diets all day long, but it doesn't matter if the food itself doesn't taste good because people just won't eat it. Exactly. And if we can eat a carrot chip or have mushroom jerky and they taste good and they give you that sort of same need or satisfaction as eating potato chips or beef jerky, plus they're healthier and better for the environment, who wouldn't want that? Sure, I know. I was really so fascinated by this discussion of local sourcing and how that's good, but doesn't really trump the benefits of going plant-based. Yeah, that was interesting to me as well and isn't something I had really considered. I almost feel like we need an org chart for all these different solutions. Like a, good, <laughs> <Yes>. better, <laughs> a good, better, best maybe. You know, I never realized we needed to prioritize some of these things over others. It's so true. Okay, so we've got a lot of information about Eat the Change in our show notes. Please make sure to check them out on social and snag some of the products. All right, Jen, talk to you in a couple of weeks. Bye, Monica. Bye. Thanks so much for listening. And if you're enjoying the podcast, we would love for you to follow us on your favorite podcast app. Give us a five-star rating and please leave us a review. It really goes such a long way towards helping us reach a wider audience and sharing these amazing interviews and solutions with the world. Absolutely. So thanks so much for following and reviewing the podcast. And we'll be back with another amazing interview in two weeks. You're now a part of the biophilic movement.